the goal of the presentation is to show that uh, the Casimir forces can be used for fuel-free propulsion. And uh, I wanted to show how starting from the building blocks of general relativity and quantum electrodynamics, uh, we can show the, the, the forces acting between pairs of atoms and clusters of atoms in a trap uh, may be used to develop thrust to the expense of energy, but without the use of fuel. Mm, okay. And so that is basically the gist of it, although right now the effect is uh, predicted to be measurable, it is small, and so part of the strategy becomes how to transform atomic traps that are today basically basic physics experiments, how to transform a, a trap into a, in, into a thruster. Uh, the problem there being that once these forces become much larger and the effects become much larger, the atoms can, the atoms can be destroyed, uh, the whole uh, system behaves in a very different way. In addition, uh, the equations are not well known about what happens to atoms in such extreme conditions. So if you go out there and you ask a typical atomic scientist how a trap behaves if it is accelerating at 10,000 times the gravitational acceleration of the Earth, they've never done that because nobody has ever been in that condition, for instance. But, but nonetheless, they do produce a, an existing reactionless force you know, in today, right? right. They, they, today, the problem simply is that you're not going to see an atomic trap today lifting off the ground. That is a vision into the far future, and by that I mean 10, 15 years it could be done. Uh, th this is based upon a science discovered by Fermi in 1921, who was the first to show that interacting electro, uh, electrically charged particles uh, are affected in the kind of fields that they produced by gravitation. To the point that if their interaction is very strong, you can make it you make the interact interaction e energy equal to the mass of the object, and therefore let it hover. Now, this is a, if you look at it classically, I discussed in, this, in the presentation today some papers by Griffiths, Cornish, uh, Boyer, in which the effect is looked at classically. <clears throat> Unfortunately, in order for two charges in a dipole to interact so strongly, that they will hover or even develop a thrust on the surrounding structure, the distance should be of the order of 10 to the minus 15 meters or about a meter. Mm, and okay. what that's telling you is that you need to do quantum mechanical calculations for this to make sense. Well, so when you describe thrust from this thing, then the, the terminology you're using in terms of hover and stuff, um, I was thinking about it in your presentation on the order of an ion drive, where it's a very slight thrust. But what you're describing sounds like it might actually be able to heft like an aircraft. Well, I, I suppose, and I, I personally have experience in the Deep Space One uh, ion uh, uh, drive uh, from years ago, uh, more on the research side than operations. And certainly that is small thrust, but keep in mind that the only difference between that and going relativistic is the fact that an ion drive at some point runs out of fuel. But if you could have even something like the ion engine that you have described, uh, run forever, you would pretty quickly get to relativistic speeds. So, yes, I envision the extreme case of a part of an, of an atomic trap that becomes your thruster that is contained inside the vehicle, and the thrust can be so very large that it actually causes the vehicle to hover. Is that possible? Uh, we still do not know if we are going to have problems to confine the particles, um, if this is simply a mathematical conclusion that cannot be reduced into engineering practice, although I firmly believe that the physics we have in our hands today uh, allows this to be reduced to practice in a, in a practical drive. So I do think that in the end, yes, we're going to have vehicles that will hover. Yeah. yeah. Well, yeah. now, in terms of an initial model, um, I mean, you mentioned like 10 to 15 years or so. Right. Do you think that that might be milligrams of thrust or something like that? Or, or? I, I, I think that the, the, the math seems to show that in this kind of situation, the larger vehicles are rewarded over the smaller implementations. So a first step here, if I were to break it down into steps, what I would say is let's first measure the effect. Let's take an atomic trap as it exists today and let's show that the weight of atoms can be changed, that the weight of the atoms can be decreased by an amount that can be measured. This is predicted by quantum mechanics, uh, by origin, the papers uh, by Fermi originally, and the calculations that I have done. Then let's increase this effect. So at some point the big question here becomes, 
is it possible to have a quantum state in which 100 atoms in a trap uh, are hovering with all the trapping lasers turned off. So you may have other lasers that are engineering the Casimir forces between these atoms, or Van der Waals forces, Casimir Polder forces, and these are all technical words for dispersion forces. You can engineer these forces, but at some point, if the trapping lasers are turned off, is it possible to take a small number of atoms and cause them to hover? And that would be, a, I think, a historic breakthrough. It wouldn't be still useful from the technological standpoint, except perhaps for some exotic application, but to have something hover in the laboratory without any support would be remarkable. Well, you know, I, I think both what you're describing as well as some of the things that Martin Timar is, is working on, uh, he's working on some laser, uh, some phase angle and some deflection experiments. It, it seems like for the first time we're starting to see real repeatable experiments, which is, which is really profound. I, I think I started to see hints of that last year at the state conference, but, but this year it's, it's even more so. Well, I, you know, I, what I want to say is that although, of course, I'm here to, to pitch our approach, I think that what, what you're seeing, in my opinion, is an attempt by the engineering community to work with an open mind. And for, for a very long time, we have had problems of uh, um, not being able to even publish unless you were saying the wrong words. And I think that, um, in some sense, the physicists are to blame. And I, I, I think that now that we are opening our minds a little bit, um, we're going to see a revolution. Now, uh, the, the details may be harder to predict, as they always are, but I think that if we just allow ourselves to go back to 1960s, 1970s mentality, when you thought everything was possible, yeah. I think that everything will be possible. Well, do you think, in, in some ways, uh, I mean, it, it seems like the heyday intellectually for a lot of this research began in the 60s, and, and, and it seems to have been kind of subdued by, by some of the more conservative threads, I guess, in the community, but um, do you think that breakthrough propulsion might end up coming in second place to, to stuff like quantum teleportation, where it, it's taking so long to develop that it may end up being outmoded even as it becomes real? I don't think so. I, I, think, that, I think that propulsion will outpace teleportation. Uh, I, you know, from, from friends that I know and people that talk about it, and I'm talking about basic physics here and what it means to teleport today, I think that we have uh, a much better chance to, to develop a thrusting system than, than to teleport in, in the medium term. Uh, but I think that what we'll discover also is that all of these approaches are not mutually exclusive. There is a, there is a purpose for all of them. And so maybe you want to have a, a radio station that is hovering in the, air, in the air at 30,000 feet or 300,000 feet or 3,000 miles, and you want to keep it there. And in that case, maybe teleporting it doesn't, doesn't make a lot of sense. <coughs> you want to have something actually hovering there. And so I think that all these solutions, once they materialize, no pun intended, uh, will we'll all have their own application. It makes sense. They're really tools in a larger kit, I guess, of, of 21st, hopefully 21st century technologies. I am very hopeful that as far as what we are proposing, uh, the first data are, will, will be far shorter than, uh, than the century that, that you're discussing. Well, now, does the, does the work that you've presented today mean that you're going to start working towards an experimental plan to, to uh, Interstellar has a laboratory, and we work on experiments. Uh, the, I do not. Uh, this is a, a, a for-profit corporation. Uh, I, I am not funded to do basic research without the idea that there is going to be, in the end, a deliverable product. Uh, however, there is no hiding from the fact that some applications are longer term than others. So Interstellar Technologies is heavily involved right now in applications of the Casimir Force to nanotechnology. Mm, okay. uh, and that means microelectromechanical systems of all types and that kind of thing that has been researched worldwide by several labs. However, as I described today, the gravitational field is nothing but another material in the ingredients that determine the Casimir force. So in that sense, we are researching that too, experimentally. You know, the, the overlap between the Casimir effect and, and how it might be used to power uh, nano devices was interesting. And it's, uh, I, I think that might be the next direction for nanotech, is integrating in with some of the, the more uh, bleeding edge concepts, I guess. Uh, let, let, I want to make a comment on that in the sense that, in my opinion, there is no nanotechnology without understanding the Casimir force. You cannot have a nano machine that can be actuated efficiently if you do not know how to engineer the Casimir force. You, you cannot have wires going in and out of this device. At that level, the larger force 
out of all of them is the Casimir force. You can either be a victim of it, or you can capitalize on it as an engineering uh, tool, which is what we see, seek to do in our company. That, that, makes, that makes sense. You know, another thing that I'd wanted as a crossover, I, I wrote an article on this a few weeks ago, was, um, well, it, it came out of Eric Davis' uh, presentation last year, where he described the amount of energy it takes to, to maintain a wormhole. And I think he'd said it takes something the size of Jupiter, or the mass of Jupiter, for even a three-foot diameter wormhole and then there was always the, the minor problem of you know, the Cherenkov radiation right. in the throat. And I thought, well, to, to steal a page from Arthur C. Clarke, um, in the light of other days, he had talked about uh, using nanoscale wormholes just to transmit single atoms. And I thought, what if you could use that as a 3D printer for materials, or, or maybe even astronauts? Well, I, 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 like, I like what you're saying, uh, because I think that all, all of us here involved in breakthrough technologies need to start thinking commercially. I, I think that it is great to think about it on the chalkboard and to elaborate with endless equations. I personally come from astrophysics and cosmology, so I am all for it. But at the end of the day, if you want to materialize serious funding, the kind of funding that makes venture capitalists feel they're going to get a return, you need to have the courage to write a business plan. And, and so for that, you need to make a translation of these ideas into a concept that will eventually be sold. I may sound cold. It may sound money-oriented, and, and, and I want you to know that I'm not a materialistic person. I simply understand the game, and I think the universities play this game very well when they, uh, get, they get their grants from the government, and I think that also people that are involved in breakthrough technologies need to be able to meet the market. That's the challenge. Great ideas. Now, how do you make it into a marketable product? Absolutely. That is the frontier, really. Absolutely. Well, yeah, I, I guess I, I'd like to touch on, well, you know, we were talking about nanotechnology. I think it'd be good to pick up there. Right, it sounds sure. like uh, Interstellar does some, some work in that area as well. Yes, absolutely. I, I, in fact, I think that if you were to put it on a, on a, on a, on a it's difficult to predict the future, you know, of course, but in my opinion, the first applications of Casimir forces would be coming from uh, nanotechnology before they come from fuel-free propulsion. Uh, and and. The reason being that there is such a volume of experimentation of quantum electrodynamics that is well understood, the technology is well understood, and the, the also I remember that my, our thrust is not only vertical in terms of the depth of the science, but also towards the market, the challenge, the, the, that challenge can be met a lot sooner in nanotechnology than it can be done uh, in a... You know, it, it almost seems like nanotech for, for the aerospace industry is it's like the tide that rises all ships because you know th there was the presentation on the bio suit and I mm -hmm. thought well nanotech has multiple applications Absolutely. there as well so yeah the bio suit was really I, I was expecting maybe a little bolder statement about what nanotechnology can do but the presenter truly did say that they would like to see new materials and that can be done um, but the, the bottom line here is that when you get to be able to act on it on the molecular level the speed increases tremendously. The kind of things you can do increases tremendously. The efficiency increases. Now the problem here is, however, that you need to be a, you need to have a customer that wants to buy these things. And so again, that's the effort. I think that you can do a lot of stuff by Casimir force actuation that has been demonstrated already in the laboratory. And the question is, can you make a product that will sell? And that's, I think, what Interstellar specializes in doing. Yeah, you know, my, my impression has also been that uh, nanotech, I, I think it's recovering, but I think it's been victimized by marketing early on. You know, they, they had uh, the nanotech lipstick, yeah. Um, yeah. I, you know, stuff like that. I, 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 certainly, I think it was victimized by misplaced expectations, um, perhaps impatience, because it came after the, uh, the, 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 the crash of uh, the telecommunications. And so people, I think, re tried to replace the heyday of that with nanotechnology, whereas these are things that require a few years to develop. Now that we have shed the, the, the bad, I think that, that the, the field will emerge stronger than ever. Oh, absolutely. Well, I mean, I, I think Interstellar, it sounds like you're one of the few organizations out there applying nanotech to space applications, which is... Yeah, I, I think that, that is correct. Uh, and in fact, wherever I turn, I see that I often hear the statement, we hired a guy to do nanotechnology in space, but then nothing came out of it. Uh, I think that nothing will come out of it so long as we continue to think in terms of 1960s applications. Uh, I had the great fortune to be involved in my last year at the Jet Propulsion Laboratory on a project called Interstellar Probe. 
And, and in the context, of, so this idea was a robotic mission to a nearby star. The, the effort is so daunting that you need to think out of the box. You need yeah. to start thinking about integrating systems. You're not thinking about another system, a system, another system. You're thinking about um, integrating everything into, into the skin of the spacecraft could be self-repairing, just to give you an idea. So you start thinking about uh, very advanced. And in fact, in our website, you will see, though, I ask that question. If you have a civilization that has made it to a nearby star, what does that civilization looks like, look like? And you will see that um, it, it cannot look the same as 1960s technologies. So that's why we believe in that. We believe that the market will drive us towards nanotechnology applications to space. However, uh, the earthbound applications will come sooner, of course. Well, you know, I, in, in, the, in the wormhole paper I'd done, I actually, the, the hang up for me was the other part of it. It wasn't necessarily so much the nanotech as an ideal, I guess. Um, my, my larger concern was um, the wormhole itself. How do you connect two points in space with the wormhole? Now, I, I'd asked Eric Davis about this, and he'd said that relativity says you can do it, but it makes no mention of how. And so. Yeah, well, and, that is, and there is also this energy problem. Uh, that you described previously, you know, the fact that enormous amount of energy should be used to achieve this goal. Now, but I, I, however, let me defend what you're trying to do and what other people are trying to do. What I want to say is that in the 1960s, uh, with there were projects in which nuclear energy was supposed to be used in very creative ways to propel spacecraft, such as rolling an atom bomb out of the back of the spacecraft every second. Now, I find that as incredible to believe as, as any war mole you're going to talk to me about. But that saw the light of day. I would like to see your idea see the light of day. So I don't discourage anybody from pursuing these things be simply because of requirements that may or may not be satisfied. Uh, at some point, we need to keep our mind open. Maybe it cannot work or it's not cheap, uh, but let's keep thinking about it.